Stefano. I am acting chair of the Italian department. And uh, I'm very happy today to introduce officially uh, the first event of this academic year of the, our uh, research group called the Toronto Italian Comic Studies. Toronto Italian Comic Studies is a, a group which is also recipient of our uh, Gojo Working Groups grant. So it's a very official and academic group. So I want to thank all the members of this uh, Toronto Italian Comic Studies group. I also want also to thank Professor Fabio Gaducci, who is our guest today, and will give uh, a lecture about uh, comics. So uh, now I think I, I have to leave the floor to Manuela Di Franco, who is a member, a founder member of the TIX group and will introduce a better than me, Professor Gaducci, the topic and so on. Thank you, Manuela. Thank you, Franco. Benvenuti a tutti. Welcome everyone. I am very excited uh, of today's talk, uh, which is the, the first official one of the group. Uh, so what is TIX, the Toronto Italian Comic Studies? Group. Um, it is a research and study group that aims to encourage and expand the debate on Italian comics at the international level. Uh, so what we want to do is also to be a bridge between the North American and European community. Uh, I am now at the moment based in the US, Alessio is in Canada. Um, we have today Professor Gaducci that is um, Base. Um, I'm sorry, why is Zoom asking me to play music? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, it was just a very weird request from Zoom. Maybe I, I don't know, I said something that triggered Zoom to suggest me to play some music. Anyway, uh, so as I was saying, we have Professor Gattucci that is based in Italy. So we start by connecting um, North America and Italy. I can see many people. Um, I won't take uh, time speaking about the Toronto Italian Comic Study Group. I'm sure that you will receive many information from us, hopefully, um, because this is just our very first event, uh, the official event. And I'm very excited that um, Professor Gaducci is going to be the first one to start our cycle of um, talks. Um, many of you already know him, uh, so my presentation will be brief. Um, so um, Fabio is interested in comics and popular culture. He published quite a lot on the topic and um, his publication include notes on the early decades of Italian comic art uh, and he is a founder of Science Studies in Graphic Narratives. He's also one of the researcher and writer of um, Eccetto Topolino that um, he wrote with Leonardo Gori and Sergio Lama that recently launched a new and uh, upgraded edition with some um, additional research. So if you have read the book, I recommend you check out the latest edition as well. If you haven't, I highly recommend you get a hold of a copy of the book because it's magnificent. Um, and Thanks. the topic, the main topic of Chatto Topolino is Americanization uh, in 90, of comics in 1930s Italy. Uh, so, um, what is the talk, today's talk about is uh, the title is Graphical Narratives, the Italian Tradition Before and After Topfer. So we start with the very beginning of European comics, uh, because we already, what well, most of us know that officially and conventionally, the, the birth of Italian comics dates to the launch of the first issue of Il Corriere dei Piccoli that was launched on uh, December 1908. Um, but this is not the very first appearance of Fumetti and Professor Gattucci will show us that. Um, so without further ado, I will leave the floor to Professor Gattucci for his presentation. Thank you again, everyone, for being here. 
Thanks, uh, Manuela. Thanks, Franco and uh, Alessio for the introduction. And of course, all the group for having me here. I'm very happy to present some of the recent and also recent work about the, the beginning of the Italian tradition on comics. I hope that this slide is clear to everybody. Please let me know otherwise, and I'll start with uh, with this. the The idea is uh, we'll you'll see that the the idea is very simple. It's try it's trying to do some kind of uh, bird eye view of the tradition from the 16th century on. I will be uh, very well. I would say sketchy in some places. I hope to give the feeling of the evolution anyhow of the of the Italian tradition, and I'll focus a bit more on um, the 19th century. That's to say, to try to understand how the uh, birth uh, the, of uh, comics in France with the appearance of Toffer and I'll has, how I'll try to argue with the beginning of uh, the um, appearance of the material by Cham and in various journals will make really a difference also for the uh, Italian landscape, of course, with some uh, difference, even some different timing, mostly due to the completely different political situation between France and, and Italy. So let's start, uh, as you can uh, say, why, why did I say top fair? I mean, there are plenty of people here that uh, in the audience that know about top, top fair much more than, uh, than me. I will simply uh, repeat the usual uh, uh, Nick for uh, Toffer, which is the father of the, the comic strip. Indeed, I mean, his work on uh, the early graphic novels and, of course, his first works on essays and reflections on the medium are nowadays considered as the starting point of the medium largely. Of course, since, I mean, uh, the the birthplace of Topfer was so nearby Italy, of course, there were some influences immediately from his work. I mean, the, what, uh, a quote that I particularly like is that the, the one that I put on top of the history of, of Albert, uh, the story of Albert is a comedy of a Moliere of today, which is by Camillo Cavour, which for those who are familiar with the um, Italian history was one of the main architects of the uh, reunification of Italy in the in 61. So for just to say that there was a short correspondence between uh, Top Fair and uh, Cavour and since uh, uh, Top Fair sent him a copy of uh, of Albert which of course uh, was quite uh, near the the heart of uh, Cavour because it's uh, uh, a conservative story troubles in in Italy at toward the time even if I'll try to argue even if I, even if I won't have that many document to to show will take a bit time the fact that actually Cham was much more relevant for the Italian tradition than than top fair I mean Casimiro Terria is maybe the most important characteristic in Italy of the 19th century and uh, he's uh, he wrote uh, <laughs> about the relevance that the work of uh, Cham had for uh, him and his work. Here I, I put a very um, story, uh, silly story from, from Cham, which I was interested in mostly because it was from uh, a, a, a story who, who's take place in Naples and actually in, in Italy. Even if, to be honest, uh, much more important were the review comic that Cham and many others started producing from the uh, late 30s and 40s for various journals. And I'll try to uh, to provide at least some proofs, some proof for the, for this. OK, so the, the idea is that we will uh, start basically with some methodolog methodological premise, and then I will uh, reach Top fair and try to illustrate the deluge of material which appear after uh, the the work of the French characterist in the forties. First of all, 
I would also say that we are much less, we are quite behind, let's say, with respect to uh, studies, for example, in French and UK, and of course, the state concerning the, the origin. For sure, there has been some reference point for the development of medium, which have been studied quite, uh, quite well, which are quite firm, so to say. And for example, uh, something that I like a lot is this uh, uh, short uh, um, story, one page story by Yambo, which was one of the main uh, artists uh, until the 30s in Italy, mostly for uh, uh, short stories and novels for uh, young adults, but also with, uh, with a lot of comics. And here is poking fun at the phonograph and, and similarly, but... Uh, and uh, this is, in fact, in one, of, I think, of the key point in the Italian tradition, which is the appearance of uh, Novellino, which was a weekly which predated by 10 years uh, Corriere dei Piccoli, but which had exactly the same formula. I will try to elaborate a bit on this later on. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, we cannot exclude the fact that there can be a lot of more material which have been forgotten we we know this is exactly what happened for example in the in the states um, and it's not going to be very different from here for example i put here a uh, 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 builder bogen basically to say a single uh, page which was sold to to kids in the in the 90s and uh, well we will uh, go back to the, this page later on in order to show uh, how this particular theme which is uh, the the way of giving uh, of trying to kill an annoying mosquitoes in the during the night can will play at a different levels depending on the um, on the context and again just as i said there may be a lot of more or more stuff yet yet around i'll try just to, to find to give you a an overview of uh, which are the main things that can be surely assessed now for, for Italian comics. Of course, it would be interesting to move beyond philology. This book of Gordon was quite important to me, at least. The fact is that the, the, the search for the relevant material should be performed together, simultaneously, with general question about the medium. That's to say, the various themes, the consumer practice, the cultural circuits, the social perception, which were the aesthetic models, and so on and so forth. So, of course, all these require uh, all each of these items require actually a lot of uh, important, uh, important and exhaustive work, which so far doesn't exist. It's very sparse the research on these uh, on these uh, on these topics in Italy. And then I will briefly very briefly only sketch this issue while i try to at least find uh to, to give an overview of uh let's say the main changes uh, in the in both the publishing practices and the attitude of the of the artist mm -hmm. of course all this is particularly pivotal in for the for the 19th for the 19th century because even if of course there was not such a consumer culture, like for example in in the, in the state or other part of Europe, for sure, this kind of the idea that it was pivotal also for or selling merchandising, for example, or so on, is clearly quite uh, present, quite clear, even at the at the time. This is a, a, an advertisement I particularly like, which is taken from Corriere dei Piccoli from 1913, where basically they were telling, well, you have seen all this wonderful uh, character. It would be nice if you buy also the, the toys. And of course, you see they were Italian produced. You can see Happy Hooligan, you can see a mod and uh, at the... Uh, one of the side, you can see also Bill Bull Bull, which is uh, one of the first iconic characters from Corriere dei Piccoli. But let's go back a moment. I'll just put this one here before uh, uh, discussing on it a bit. Like you say, it's Historia Figurata di Giuseppe Mastrilli. That's to say a story in picture of Giuseppe Mastrilli, which was basically... Uh, 
a thief or uh, one a rogue for the, in in the in the 18th century. And why I put in, I'm putting there, I will not try to enter into discussion about what is a comics. Mm. I'll just simply let's say that I won't deal, I won't deal, I won't enter the discussion about where this stuff was actually published. And I'll simply argue that whoever is trying to use text and picture for telling a story is basically fine, fine with me independently of what was supposed to be uh, the use of the material. For example, this one is supposed to be a fan. Mm? You see that there is a, a line in the middle. You have to put a stick to glue the two side, and then you use it for, um, well, in front of a fireplace or for use or for uh, um, uh, having, making some wine in order to refresh yourself. And... It's in a play, it's a use which would be surprising so far, but I mean, it's clearly a story and it is, and the support where it is uh, delivered is something which is unusual of our, of our standard. But it doesn't matter, as long as they try to use a combination of text and speech, I will basically be fine with me. Okay? Given that, let's go back where most of us started actually from a picture taken from Kanzel, actually. Not really from from Kanzel. This one is taken from uh, the Bertarelli collection in Milan, where Kanzel took many of his uh, pictures in his uh, pivotal uh, work. It's true that there is a very very variegated Italian landscape. Mm? There has been a large production since the 16th century, immediately after the the invention of the printing press. Mm? and uh, with a lot of uh, prints but very few satirical issue most of them were religious or traditional motives mm? the uh, i put there remondini which were one of the main uh, producer in the 18th century but there are really really a lot of these kind of things this one is uh, quite uh, quite famous it's from the late 17th century it's uh, Vita del Lascivo, and it basically it's a moralizing story about how bad it is to go um, with Arlots, and to that's the main the main issue of the of the twelve prints, which are anyhow uh, relevant in its own because it's it's a very nice series of print, and of course it's uh, well known now to be one of the basis of the work of uh, um, of Hogarth. Uh, decades, decades later, which was very familiar with the, with the Venetian production of the time. Then, and of course, uh, there are also a few uh, uh, additional things, like for example, this from the Fregonard collection, which is a series of print uh, collected during the Louis XIV um, reign. And this one was basically a series of prints that was given uh, that was given away. Uh, to the audience of um, uh, a play, uh, of a Commedia dell'arte play, with the idea that they were somehow summing up uh, the text of the comedy itself in order to be taken at home as a keepsake. There are, of course, this kind of material is quite difficult to come by. The Fregonard collection in uh, Stockholm, if I correct, remember correctly, is quite an an, uh, an exception, but it is, of course, also the interesting idea, the fact that uh, there were, uh, how can I say, a common interest in having this kind of production, which was considered as interesting in order to capture audience. So not only official prints for printers, but also as uh, uh, giveaways in, in a theater, which is also Interesting in itself because there is a large work of uh, Thierry, Thierry Molderen uh, trying to figure out how actually the 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 work on P on uh, theater and mimics of theater actually played a relevant role in the development of the artistic theory of uh, Top Fair. This is from the English edition of a book by Engels in uh, 1822. Okay, so let's say there was plenty of material around and uh, it was appearing in different 
place. It's somehow quite quite peculiar. Of course, not that much has survived, but it's clear that we can uh, be sure that there was, despite the tains were mostly religious, there was anyhow a production of this kind of material for a large part. And there is even more if we go to the late 18th century. Hmm? For example, a theme which is coming back is the Maria Jalamod by Hogarth, which is or Ogar, which is uh, uh, taken by one of the uh, great artists of the late uh, 18th century in Italy, which is Carlo, Carlo Lazzino, which produced 12, 12 prints together with another well-known engraver, which is Piattoli, for the Bardi publisher in Florence in 1796 and it was basically 12 prints which were uh let's say uh reproducing uh, uh mimicking so to say the themes of maria jalamoda of course in a completely different context very little uh, freedom of press a, a very very strong censorship so that for example there is none of the uh, moral and quite crude themes that you can find in the prints by by Hogarth, but something which is uh, completely different like here that to say everybody's smiling it's uh, quite uh, a a kind of uh, uh relaxed environment where things are actually are actually appearing and uh, there is of course also uh, another uh, uh, some other prints like for example this uh, this one which is reasonably unknown it's a satirical take on the uh, egyptian uh, 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 adventure of uh, napoleon mm -hmm. and of course i mean here we are in uh, 1798 of course uh, during the Napoleonic Wars and let's say the all the uh, uh, moments uh, in in Italy where there was um, how can I say a loosening of the censorship and there was the introduction of the first attempt of, of free press they were of course both uh, liberal but also conservative and this one is clearly mimicking the style of G. Ray I would say that to say of the English of the British of the British authors, I, I, where the the audience here, these two Turks are quite skeptical of the balsam which is offered to them by by Napoleon. Okay, but of course, what happened is that um, well, immediately after the restoration, censorship became again very strong. So. It's very difficult to find, in general, uh, prints uh, with uh, which are not quite stereotypical and uh, quite classical in in the presentation. And basically, most of the experiment, as far as we are able to to find so far, disappear. Mm -hmm. So we have to 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 leap, basically, to a uh, to quite some times after, and basically. Uh, check what happened during the 47 48 uh, revolution years okay i will just make a, a short detour about uh, about uh, top fair again mm -hmm. and in particular saying that uh, everybody knows that uh, um, the uh, the albums by top fair were seen by Goethe, who actually produces quite some uh, strong appreciation for uh, for the for the artist, but he, Top Fair himself said that he brought uh, with uh, uh, Jabot with him along with him uh, during a visit to Italy, which of course should refer to the 1833 visit to to Italy. Mm -hmm. Even if, to be honest, I've not been able to, and nobody so far has been able to find any uh, any trace of this visit and who well whoever could, he could have shown his uh, his material so i mean it's quite an interesting quite an interesting uh, bit of trivia mm -hmm. but let's go back to a, a more um, to to our timeline so to say mm -hmm. the fact is that like like i said the 30s are a period where the restoration is still quite strong in italy basically very little uh, freedom of press 
and basically no caricature as far as we are able to see on um, Italian magazines. Mm? Things start to change in 47. Okay, this is the first uh, occurrence that we are able, we, so far has been found, which is by an author which is called Sam. Mm? The other author we'll see in a moment is called Jafet. So you can imagine that, of course, both of them were actually indebted to Cham, mm? given the given their uh, the name that they have uh, that they have chosen. It's a very crude story. It's uh, basically poking fun to a book who was just published about a new theory of the universe. I found the, I mean, this is on the, the second page of the, of the Mondi Illustrato in 1847. I like it. I mean, an additional bit that I like is that the magazine was making at a, a half a page of advertising for that book in that same issue. So basically they were spitting on, um, on the guy who was paying them for the advertising. But anyhow, <laughs> beside that, it's uh, curious. It's a bit uh, crude, I was saying. But what I, what I am saying is that after that, there will start to appear a lot of satirical themes which are linked to the political aims of the authors, always in these couple of years. And of course, there will be always dependent on the uh, work of the French artist of the time. In fact, if we see the advertential degli editori, that to say um, a note from the publishers, which basically say, sebbene ci fossimo da prima proposti di non ammettere in questo giornale le cosiddette caricature, che ci sembrava una soverchia imitazione dei fogli stranieri. That's to say, even if at the beginning we didn't want to put, to allow in our journal, in our magazine to have a caricature, because they were, they looked like an imitation of uh, foreigner uh, papers. Mm? Again, it's not so surprising. Uh, in Pedmont was, uh, uh, the elite was basically speaking French. So for sure, they were quite familiar with what was produced in France at the time. And this particular publisher, Pomba, which was one of the main publishers of the time, with his Mondo Illustrato, which is one of the first illustrated weekly in Italy, largely illustrated with original uh, uh, woodcuts, hmm, decide to go for, uh, uh, to allow caricature. And in fact, there was same political aim, if we see Immediately after, I mean, after a few, five weeks, actually, also in OT47, there was this uh, Viaggio and Alcune Avventure di Algemane Zeitung, which is basically poking fun at uh, this uh, journal, the Algemane Zeitung, who was a, who actually had made some remarks about Lago Maggiore, and they are, I can say, as we're into to that, but of course, I mean, doing that in um, in Turin, well, it was safer than doing that, for co of course, in Milan, but, of, but it was anyhow a strong political choice at the, at the time. And uh, again, what happened after the 47, 48, okay? Again, revolutions, uh, the revolution period uh, end, ends. And what happened is that basically freedom of press is restored only in, Pe in Piedmont, okay, in Piemonte. So basically uh, this kind, the new caricature, uh, illustrated story and so forth, on and so forth will appear basically only in Turin. With a few exceptions, Milan, for example, sometimes Florence, but mostly just there, at least for what is called the, the waiting decade, that's to say the 50s. And with, anyhow, a lot of influence, and I would like to think also with some influence given back to the... <coughs> To the to other countries. Uh, this one is a wonderful sketch by Teia from 1860, which is about the uh, Sicily Revolution, which was going on at the time with um, 
with Garibaldi. And basically, this is a barber who is discussing the political events and is basically uh, mistreating his customer, either with uh, too tight a knot uh, on the neck or, uh, uh, how can I say, trying to put too, too warm water on his face in order to to cut his fo the foam in order to cut his bird and what what i like in particular of this is that well it's quite reminiscent at least my idea of of another well-known well-known uh, uh, artist a much better known artist actually which is if you check this and you see, for example, this vignette from Bush, Der Barbier, and so on, which is five years later, it seems quite reminiscent of this or later of this. So, what is the what I'm trying to, to sell? That the Ped Mountain uh, artist and magazine were quite well inserted in a European context with a lot of what is called in Italy after, uh, after a famous. Uh, uh, writer uh, uh, Antonio Faetti, uh, Circolazione dell'Immaginario, that to say the way that this kind of picture, uh, uh, text and so on were circulating among all the European countries. And uh, as I say, not only textual, and would, uh, I like the idea that somehow, beside uh, taking a lot of influence, I won't be able to discuss or to present uh, <coughs> many of them. But let's say there was a lot of influence also going outside of, of a small part of Italy where there still was freedom of press. Okay, in the meanwhile, there were produced also a few albums, very few of them. Besides these two, there are another couple which are uh, which are um, which have been found so far. Only one of them was uh, Toffer inspired, or most of the other were basically, uh, I would say, Chum inspired, uh, given the presentation. Well, for the one on the by Colonna will be a bit more precise. Pasquino is one of the most famous uh, uh, album of the 19th century in Italy, one of the few actually. Mm -hmm. And it's basically um, uh, done for uh, the opening of the Suez channels, as you can as you can imagine, it which was a big event uh, all around Europe and also in Italy with Verdi giving an opera, <coughs> uh, giving an opera there, and there were a lot of uh, uh, reportage from the from the opening where Teia is all, was also there and it was one of the main uh, character appearing in all these uh, reportages. And he wrote his own uh, album, his own uh, uh, graphic witness, so to say, for, for this. The one on the, on, the, on the left, the one by Colonna, it was produced in, uh, in Naples, is a bit more interesting because, well, it goes back to the circula circulazione dell'immaginario that I was saying before, because, well, this one was done 10 years before in, in Paris. The producer was uh, Aubert, which is a well-known uh, name in uh, uh, comic circle, at least, but I mean, it's in general as a, as a publisher of uh, the time. And it's curious that uh, 10 years later, <clears throat> the same uh, album was basically swiped mm, and reproduced for the for an audience in uh, in Naples what i can say is that, that we can remark the difference of the appearance here you see on on the left the original uh, the original material where you have a layout which is either rather uh, uh, dynamic and which is with all the various uh, step which are telling what what's going on <coughs> During the, the the student who is leaving to go and study medicine in in Paris, while there, basically, it's much more similar to an illustrated book, where basically one of the main events is taken out and becomes the whole the whole page. Again, it's not so surprising in the end because these pages were appearing first in as. A, 
as a giveaway for a weekly, la ricreazione. So basically they had, to a certain extent, to make sense on their own because they could, the buyer could have decided to just take a single, uh, a single page instead of the whole album, which was to be collected later on after all the pages had appeared in, in the wheel. But anyhow, let's say it's clear that uh, there was a lot of reflection, but in general, the, the way of producing and uh, the, the storytelling, so to say, of the Italian author somehow had to, had to many more restrictions than was uh, common in uh, in France, for example. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, uh, I didn't put any, any example because there are so many riviste comic in the way that I was shown, I was shown for Cham appearing um, basically everywhere. Mm -hmm. I <coughs> There were basically comments on the effects of the week in the weeklies or effect of the month in the monthly of the effect of the years in the uh, yearly supplement uh, Almanacco, and they are everywhere. Mm? Basically, if, um, if you don't know if you are familiar, but basically they were just uh, um, single vignette where there were a few, uh, a few lines of text uh, below, and they were very, very loosely uh, related one to the, <coughs> to the other. And there are many of them. I just took... Uh, Two examples, one from 8085. Um, the author is unknown, he signed himself Trismark, which could not be the original name, um, but I like it because it's from La Commedia Humana, which is a, a magazine for who ran for a couple of years, a small one, ran for a couple of years by, <coughs> by Achille Bizzoni, which was a, a relevant political and literary figure at the time, who was not, how can I say, Bill, <laughs> who was more than willing to use some kind of uh, review like this in his magazine, or this one from Caramba, La Luna. La Luna is one of the most famous uh, uh, magazine of the late 80s and 90s, with a lot of color, even if the page I've chosen is not so so uh, it doesn't clearly show that. Uh, it's uh, called La Settimana, which is basically, so again, a review of the week, uh, what happened in, in the week. And I've chosen that simply because uh, the, last, uh, um, the last vignette is basically showing a naked woman. And I like uh, what he's saying that basically, well, it's very, all this is very, very tiring. It would have been better to, to try the movies, hmm? which uh, coming from 1897, I found it a bit, uh, a bit fun to look. But again, they are just random examples. Uh, there are so many of them around. And this is, um, uh, uh, how can I say, a trait which keeps on going until the 20s, basically. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so they start from the 50s in Pedmont, then from the 60s and 70s, when there is uh, freedom of press, they start to appear basically everywhere, uh, and they keep on going for a long time as a trade union between risorgimento issue and what was going, what was going on later on. Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, yes, together with another issue that I'm not going to touch here, which is pupazzettismo, that to say the way of presenting a mix of text and picture, which is due mostly to Gandolin and which will become to identify personal caricature in Italy until, until the 30s and 40s of the 20th century. But no time for that. Mm? Okay, so I was saying th this is a kind of, of common trait of all these uh, <clears throat> stories uh, co going from up to the uh, going from the 47 from the 48 up to the 20s of the of the 20th century mm -hmm. but i mean from mid 70s on after the death of the basically all the creators of the italian states to say after the death of in particular of vittorio emanuele the second, then his son Humbert, Umberto. Actually, uh, the, the period is called Umbertinia because the, all the issues of Risorgimento are starting to, to disappear, and many of the, <clears throat> of the traits start to be, many of the themes become, start to become more social than, uh, than, strictly, than strictly political. 
Mm. This is a typical example by, from 92. Mm. It's called uh, Nano Rosso. It's a very small uh, uh, magazine. Mm. It's uh, very cheap in the end. It, it costed five, five cents. Mm. Uh, the author is probably Ottavio Rodella, or Tavio Rodella, how he was called, which was one of the of the staple of the publisher Perino in the 80s and until the mid 90s. And of course, it's a very salacious joke, at least for the time, of course. Basically, the two were discussing the romantic flings that they had during their youth. And one of them is telling that he had a very, very strong fling with a woman who turns out to be now the wife of the other. Mm. Be salacious not to... Not too funny, but I mean, um, what is what? The, anyhow, it's a kind of com, of confirm of what I was saying here. That to say, the idea that uh, uh, cultural and social environment changes, and also the publishing pub practice and styles start start to change. And in this period, the the number of small cheap booklets like this start to be, to to be very very large, mostly with this kind of, of themes. Mm? <clears throat> so rich production with popular themes. The most uh, well-known example is the production of the publisher Perino in, in Rome, which is quite com quite large, but unfortunately, which there is basically very little done so far with respect, for, for example, to audience consumption. I'll tell you more, there is still no clear um, uh, uh, list index of the Perino production, which, I mean, it's incredibly large, but for which the studies uh, of the uh, reconstruction of the output dates already to a few decades, few decades back, and which are for sure quite faulty. Mm. Anyhow, let's take, a, uh, just to show specifically one example for this time, mm, the specimen, mm, uh, 1894, Lucello, I mean, I assume that the Italian speaking people is already, uh, I mean, smiling a bit. I mean, Lucello is a, one, uh, is a vulgar, um, is a uh, vulgar word in Italian for the penis, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> of course, given this, uh, this uh, name was clearly to underline the erotic tones uh, of such a of such a production. And Passan, I will note that uh, uh, the picture here of the girl on the, not the one on the bed, the girl with the cage, is actually, has been used and used over and over for at least 40 years. I have the first example from the 1850s, that's to say, these kind of woodcuts were keep on being present basically uh, everywhere. But in this particular things, just in order to show <clears throat> how this specimen can be used for what I was saying is that, first of all, the publisher, the publisher is Salani, they will become a, an important educational uh, uh, publisher in the 20th century, but they have their roots in popular prints or popular almanacs like this one. <clears throat> the owner here, which is the corporal of the fourth regiment of the eighth company or something like this, uh, this Pontremilli Giuseppe, which is, uh, which is on top. Uh, just, just in order to understand who was actually a reader of this kind of uh, material. And of course, from our point of view, is the fact that there was plenty of comics inside. Mm? Again, uh, you have to, to keep in mind that it's a very, very small uh, booklet. Mm? So, of course, uh, the comics were produced in, in uh, two vignettes per page. Eh? But, of course, this is clearly a very simple and not so, so, funny, so funny job. But still, I mean, I would be considered a comic. And, in fact, there is plenty of this material which is around in the late uh, <clears throat> 19th century. Mm? For example, there is a Il Gallo Caricaturista, which is an in-house organ of a factory, all the possible things, which was basically like Mondo Humoristico, uh, reproducing uh, um, caricature and comics from all around the world. Mm? Basically, I do not know exactly how the, 
how the copyright worked. Um, nobody knows, of course, but it's clear that it, it was supposed to be a, um, an effort with a lot of correspondence around, around the world. Huh? And of course, they boast the fact that they are a journal humoristic, that to say humoristic weekly uh, for the family, hmm? all ages. <laughs> oh, and of course, there were plenty of these uh, things here, which again are very, very uh, cheap, a small booklet. Uh, that, that's why by the Degar, uh, like uh, the, they're basically pocket also with the presence of comics, like uh, the one, non blagate ciò che non avete, that's uh, blagate is of course uh, um, uh, a copy of the, of the blag, uh, uh, of the French blag. Mm -hmm. And again, they were used also in some, um, uh, quite difficult to, to believe places like a pedagogical tool. They were given some picture without uh, without text, and the pupils have to write down the text for such for such uh, pictures. Or you can and you can see that the things are starting to move slowly toward different uh, uh, <clears> toward <throat> different audience in things like this one this is uh, yet another uh, salani i think uh, production from the 70s eh? le tribolazione della donna per una pulce which basically there is an insect which is giving uh, which is annoying uh, a woman who is going to uh, to bed and of course she keep on moving up and down in order to to try to kill the insect and of course in the meanwhile is showing some some legs Mm, of course, this one has a clearly um, erotic undertones. And what is funny is that you may remember the one that I was telling that I've shown initially from the 89. This is Caccia Nocturna. This is uh, uh, Bilderbogen, which was supposed to be sold to uh, kids. I mean, the name was Folletto dei Bambini. So it was clearly for kids. And where there is basically an adaptation of the various picture, mm, <clears throat> which are actually uh, redrawn, swiped, and so on and so forth. And the girl is changed into a much less worrying uh, guy with a hat. Mm. But of course, the story is exactly, is exactly the same. We will go back often to Folletto dei Bambini because, uh, well, <clears throat> the 48 49 issue appeared only the last one were original in the sense drawn in italy even if swiping other <coughs> other uh, story other artists like like this one most of them we will see are actually dependent from william bush we will go to that in a moment okay let's try to sum up so far at the end of the of the century, both Perino, the main popular publisher, and Teia, the most popular caricaturist, die. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned them because they were they had their roots firmly in the Resorgimento issue, in the Resorgimento instances. Even if, of course, they were, especially Perino, changing completely publishing practices, uh, themes, and so on, and so on and so forth. It's clear that they have. Uh, the the scene is completely changing. It's completely is quite lively. Uh, the publishing scene is quite lively, and what we can say is that comics have become an accepted and appreciated expression form, hmm? with a clear link to a European context, well accepted, hmm? <clears throat> and with the terms ranging from salacious to all ages. Hmm? So by the end of the nineteenth century, we have this particular situation. So what I'll try to answer now is how come comics became for children, at least in Italy. Huh? It's clear that from the 20s, 1920s on, comics are deemed as a medium for children. And I'll try to understand how this one has been, has been possible. So I'll start with the, the first magazine for children who is for sure presenting comics, mostly Bush, to be honest, and which is Giornale dei Bambini. It was an important magazine for various uh, reasons. It was uh, 
a conglomerate who had a lot of uh, newspaper and uh, it was uh, directed at least nominally by Ferdinando Manertini, who was a main uh, uh, man of uh, literature and one of the main political actors of the of the, I mean, one of the main political protagonists of the time. So it was a very, very well-funded uh, event, okay? And of course, so it, after after some time, they start to to re republish Bush with uh, without um, thinking too much about that. And of course, this one is then co uh, copied, uh, by Folletto dei Bambini. As you can see, they throw away some of the woodcuts and they re reproduce the rest. Uh, uh, of course, there is, we know still very little about the way that they were rich in Italy, which way that the reception adaptation was done. Mm? Even if for sure there was, uh, I like to point out this one. This, this is from the Fliege by Bush. It's a very well-known uh, a picture story. I like the fact that they changed this, which was probably containing beer or something, with a flask for wine. So at least they have done some this minimal adaptation in order to to make it more clear for the for an Italian for an Italian audience. But actually, at least for for Giornale di Bambini, we know much more because since it was such a well-funded venue, there were plenty of. Uh, uh, important uh, um, writer and artist who were working for that. We know that they received a lot of woodcuts from all around Europe and that they were basically hiring people uh, in order to uh, write um, uh, novel around the pictures. Mm? Or like, like here, because maybe you have not seen clearly, but of course the text behind the picture was completely changed. I mean, the all important and clear things was the use of the woodcast that could be used and reused for, for a long time. And at least this letter from Biagi to Bruschi, who were two of the main uh, people working for Giornale dei Bambini, who are actually saying how they should present uh, a picture story that they have just received. And they say, well, we should put the vignette like this. We should put uh, the border everywhere. Or, I mean, it's a very long letter. Basically, all of them discussing how they should present this uh, 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 story, which is Nerina, which appeared in the September 1st, uh, 1881. And it is uh, of, uh, as far as I'm, uh, I was able to understand, of English origin, even if it's quite, uh, an exception because most of the material was German at the time, probably due to the various uh, travels that Ferdinando Martini, as a politician, was doing all around Europe at the time. Again, like I said, mostly Bush on the left, Giornality per i Bambini, on the right, the Pulletto per i Bambini edition. Mm -hmm. And so we go after we have seen what happened in the, in the 80s and, and the 90s, and there are a few more journals basically reusing continuously the material produced for Giornale di per i Bambini and by the Perino publisher, at a certain point, they start to appear also American comics. Mind you, there were already plenty of American comics in Mondo Moristico and uh, uh, Gallo Caricaturista, okay? What is, uh, in, uh, for example, opera? Uh, basically, it is basically everywhere. The the about the American comics. One of the interesting things, which was quite well known in the Italian comic researcher lore, is the appearance of this, of this uh, badly retraced yellow cover, which is on the back cover of Novellino Third Year of 1901. Is the only appearance, uh, as far as we uh, as far as we know so far. Of yellow kid in uh, in Italy, but what is even more surprising is that they are starting now to drop the uh, material which has been used so far until the 90s of the 19th century and to start adapting uh, American comics. How come? Besides the fact that are they re are these really the first? We have no idea. But why them? How come? Which source? So far we have. There is basically no, no idea. It's true that at least for the three, four years, 
there are plenty. Uh, I mean, Novellino, which start on the Christmas of 1898, uh, mm, is interesting because it, it's clearly, it's from Rome, it's clearly on the footstep of, of Perino, is actually uh, shares a lot of things in the presentation, pedagogy and so on and so forth with Corriere dei Piccoli, so that if we really should put a, a date for the start of the Italian comics, I would say that for sure it is Novellino in the Christmas of 1890. 98 but unfortunately so uh, novellino went around at least in the until the end of the 1920s when it merged with another weekly who was to become very important for the italian uh, scene which is il giornalino the catholic weekly week very important in the 50s and 60s but of course there is no uh, exhaustive list for the american characters in novellino even if, uh, I mean, I, I simply a check that I've done in my collection, which is to say that most of the stuff is from 1903, and they are mostly Foxy Grandpa and the Cats and Jumber Kids, like this one, which of course, widely is wiped and retraces, and at least in Italy, mostly well known for their appearance in Corriere dei Piccoli a decade later. But again, they start already, already here. Very well, from comics to fumetti. Uh, it's, what we can say is that for sure, the uh, putting the Corriere dei Piccoli as the beginning of the story of the Catalan comics is a, a myth. Mm. It's, beside that, uh, everything has still to be rediscovered, so to say. We know a lot how the Corriere dei Piccoli started. There has been a lot of research about the beginning and the work of the um, various uh, founders, uh, um, in particular of the of Lombroso, who was working who was working there. But to really understand how this material arrived before the circulation and so on, there are some some uh, investigation of the time around the 10th, uh, 19th, 10th, so already a bit a bit late, where it was uh, where the children were saying that they were buying simultaneously Corriere dei Piccoli and Novellino. Hmm? Novellino in the long run will lose the race with Corriere dei Piccoli, and we I'll try to argue why in a, in a, in a little, but let's say it was for sure important. Anyhow, it's still uh, in, the, in the infancy, any study of the Novellino except in order to understand how much uh, this kind of presenting material was actually influent for example in the later in the later generation at least in the first decade of the 20th century okay now let's go shortly to Corriere dei Piccoli mm -hmm. just to say this is Buster Brown it's uh, the, the very fa famous first issue of, uh, of Corriere dei Piccoli in, in the Christmas 1908. They make a point of using mostly uh, American characters uh, uh, from the United States. There is mostly it was uh, an arrangement with Hearst, but they are using many of the syndicates there. Now, for example, if you check with Little Nemo, they're using the pages coming from both syndicates without any, any problem. Even if everything disappeared, they completely redo the uh, the layout of the, the page. They delete everything. They just put the log of the Unione Zincografica, who was actually probably taking care of doing the rearrangement and the changes of, of uh, layout, so that they will basically sell this kind of material together with, well, with Corriere della Sera, who was at the time, together with Secolo, the most important uh, newspaper in Italy. And in fact, like Giornale dei Bambini, Corriere dei Piccoli has the strong uh, point that it was a concerted effort by Albertini, by then the director of Corriere della Sera, to be able to cover all the needs of the family. La lettura was a a monthly for the literary elite, then there was a newspaper, then there was a Domenica del Corriere there was for the family, Corriere dei Piccoli for the children. So in order to cover basically all the need of a middle class, high class family, basically. And in fact, what is new uh, with Corriere dei Piccoli? Very little. Hmm? 
okay, there is plenty of advertising, but I mean, this was in Milan, so it makes a lot of sense that there were plenty of, of people willing to advertise uh, on uh, on a, a magazine for uh, for children. Even if I have to admit that the the kind of uh, products which are advertised are very peculiar. They they move, they go from um, health products to to whatever, mm. and. Uh, as for the rest, well, same verses. I mean, the style was exactly the same like before. I mean, you had the vignette and you have some text below the vignette. Mm -hmm. the, the same kind of pedagogy, which is kind of educational matters, at least in the beginning, eh, when Lombroso was uh, behind the early, the early issue. But then, of course, uh, everything will change. I mean, uh, Carriere de Piccoli has a very, very long story. They stop it basically after 90 years. So they have a very long story. And the difference is more colors, more money, and the chance of hiring the best authors, the best Italian authors at the time, who decide to keep on going with the, who choose or were forced to choose, to keep on going on the way of presenting comics exactly the, the same way that it was done since the uh, 1880s, basically. Okay. But of course, the fact is that everybody was, uh, they were incredibly, incredibly great artists. Like Attilio Mussino was one of the most prolific. Here he's making with his uh, character, Bill Bull Bull, who actually leave the metaphor. So it become random, uh, red, uh, become yellow for envy, white for being uh, uh, scared, and then he's painted black. Actually, I mean, this is well known, but there are plenty of other um, uh, example of stories which are played around the change of colors of the protagonist. Um, uh, and uh, of course, since the, the 80s, 90s, when to have uh, to produce a magazine in color started to become uh, possible. Uh, but then there are some seminar long story by Simon, Renato Simoni, who was the main intellectual and was one of the frequent composer of the verses of the Correre dei Piccoli. And Antonio Rumino is an, uh, also one of the main artists of that uh, period. And they produce uh, this uh, Collegio La Delizia, which runs basically for uh, uh, 28 uh, episodes. There are some iconic characters like uh, Sergio Tofano in Bonaventura. Sergio Tofano is also a main playwright in Italy, and Bonaventura will appear basically everywhere, advertising theaters and so on and so forth. So become really an iconic character, and everybody still in Italy know who Bonaventura is. Let, let's say at least if you are uh, older than thirty, I would say at least. Mm -hmm. And in the meanwhile. Uh, when this was was going on until the twenties, there was a, an intermediate step because given by the First World War, it's well known that uh, from the 1970, 1980, what what were called Giornali di Trincea started to appear. Mm? That to say, they were magazine for propaganda toward the the servicemen, mm? and at in all of them, but in particular in one of the most famous, which is La Tradotta, there all the authors of Corrierino basically went to work for La Tradotta in order to produce comics for soldiers, which, mind you, were mostly illiterate peasant at the time. Okay, so with the idea that, well, we have done this kind of material for children. Let's try to do the same things with a lot of caricature, comics, and so on for, uh, well, lower classes, basically. Okay. Again, then we, are, we arrive till the 31, and then I will basically stop discussing about Corriere dei Piccoli. Why 31? Well, the original uh, director dies, then it becomes a very, very fascist uh, uh, weekly, even if they he tried to balance his uh, adhesion to the regime uh, with and to the typical liberal uh, issue that were at the basis of the Corriere dei Piccoli until the mid twenties, after the legge specialism on the press by by Mussolini. And so let's try to sum him up again, and then I can I can stop. Well, 
The Correa de Piccoli was strongly influential, at least that by the 20s, the comics are surely perceived as a medium for children. This is probably due to the enormous success of uh, Corriere de Piccoli, which actually changed the, the game. Or uh, follower classi. Popolo Bambino is a famous book by Gibelli and was saying that the way that the attitude, pedagogical, pedagogical attitude of the elite tower, the lower classes was basically a uh, the child people and uh, people as a as a child and this was the same attitude and uh, that we can see for example in the in the tradotta uh, magazine mm -hmm. they will instead have a resurgence and become a medium for young adults in the 30s well with the introduction of the uh, american adventure hero like in particular flesh gordon but this is really really a completely different story. That's it. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you so much for this uh, extremely uh, informative and uh, rich presentation. Um, now, if you can stop sharing your screen, maybe we can see who's sure. still around thank you thank you um okay um so again we have a couple of minutes for uh, some q a um but to start uh, i see that there are there were already some comments in the in the chat like this is one of the uh, pros mm -hmm. of doing this via zoom that people can start discussing while the presentation is still happening mm -hmm. um so uh the first two questions concern the chums work uh, did Italians mm. see Chum's work more than others? So what, was it published in Italian journals? And can we call Chum's reviews comics if they were non-narrative pages? So uh, do, do you have something to, to comment on this? Like you you, you explained oh, it a bit. Um, uh, yeah. Well, yes. I mean, uh, uh, I don't... Um, there are a few examples of uh, some swipe of chums, but of course I cannot really uh, say um, anything particular about uh, the influence of chum. There are a few witnesses like Casimiro Teria saying that, look, if I started doing caricature, it was thanks to chum and what I was reading in the 40s when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And being uh, Casimiro Teria, the most important caricaturist of the of the era of the 19th century in Italy, for sure, then it's clear, let's say, a kind of relevant uh, point. And yes, uh, review comics are not comics. I agree. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cham did also a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, the things that was most copied from the French weeklies were the uh, weekly reviews. Mm -hmm. They appear really everywhere. The um, the comic narratives, the sequential narratives are um, less common than, than that. But of sure, there are also a few examples of, uh, of them. Let's say that they come from the same milieu. It's true that they are not uh, um, uh, comics in the sense that, that the sequence is very, very, very loose. Uh, um, and maybe it's just a thematic, uh, um, <clears throat> just a thematic uh, uh, link, like the fact that, for example, in the one that I was showing by Comedia Humana di Bizzoni, by Bizzoni, there was basically a guy who was telling to all the people around how good Comedia Humana is. Uh, but for sure, they are very, very weak. Nevertheless, it's clear that they it just uh, a showing of the influence that the French weeklies were having at the time and I and I assume that uh, even the <clears throat> how can I say even the uh, ratio of uh, um, uh, review comic versus comics in France was more or less the same as in Italy I mean this is completely out of thin air right? so take it with a lot of salt but I would say it, it happens exactly the same even in uh, in France many more uh, weekly review, which were easy to produce and they were quite successful, apparently, much less comics, which were harder to do. And mostly in album, at least in France. 
there is very, very few examples of albums. I cannot say four or five in Italy until the, the 70s, I would say. So, I mean, because the market was much more primitive. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, does anyone else have questions? You can either use uh, the <clears throat> raise your hand function in the reactions or just use the chat and I can read the question aloud. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, Professor Somigie, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'm happy. I'll start. Um, I have a question. So um, you look um, at caricatures and, in general, comic uh, forms of uh, of uh, um, cartoons, proto comics, and so on. Um, what I'm wondering if in Italy there was a, in the uh, uh, second half of the 19th century, let's say, a tradition of illustrated um, newspapers and magazines, like you have, for instance, in England, where there is a proliferation of, um, of magazines that illustrate often with a kind of sequential sort of approach, things like, you know, famous crimes. Um, you have them, I, you know, in the uh, 18, I would say 1880s, uh, by the 1880s. Um, and those also, uh, that, you know, comics, of course, for especially in Italy, become quickly a medium that seems to be directed at children. But I'm wondering if, is there a, a tradition, as far as you know, of sequential art that could be also looked at as proto comics? that was not directed at that kind of an audience, that was more on serious matters, that was more less comical and more, you know, that might appeal more to, you know, the audience's interest in gruesome murders and these kind of things? Oh, a few. Mm. Let's say it, there, is, <coughs> there, is, there is plenty of uh, sequential narratives until the 80s, 90s, mm. and even a bit on the new... And new centuries with various themes, uh, but the main issue were all age fun and salacious things, much less about gruesome or uh, something like that. And the main period was I mean, there was already something in the 50s and 60s, but the main period is the 25 years from mid 70s until the end of the of the century. And this you, you find plenty of these, but no, I mean. Again, I cannot say that I've seen a lot. I, mean, I cannot say that I see everything, but I, I think I've seen a lot. And there is basically very little interest in, in gruesome picture and stories. Um, mostly comic or uh, something, anyhow, on the safer side, or uh, salacious like um, half-naked girls or, uh, or the like. But no, nothing on, on that side. I don't know if it is a matter of... Uh, Censorship, which could also be. Okay, My, I have no idea if it's not been investigated, but as far as we have been able to see material, there is very little of this kind, very little. Yeah, because I think that the Illustrated Press is a really interesting, you know, how the Illustrated Press in the second half of the 19th century really changes the way that, you know, news are presented and so yeah, very interesting. I Thank agree, you. but if you check, for example, Illustrazione Italiana, mm, you can find some comics, but I would say nothing like, uh, like that. And, uh, well, of course, I mean, I cannot say that uh, I, uh, everything has been seen and it would be very interesting to, uh, to search better for, uh, for this. But um, my first impression would say no. Very little. Some use of comics, not for uh, depicting very uh, extreme events. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Next, we have a question from Ben Catcher. Oh, hi. I, I was wondering <laughs> if in your research you came across any um, connections between the tradition of the cantastoria, the, the picture reciter, 
and, and if there was a print component to that, like in England, the, the ballad sheets of the pre before the in the 18th century and earlier? Uh, well, um, yes or no, in the sense that, of course, there is a, a, a tradition of illustrated ballad canta story in Italian are also an important folklore uh, 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 protagonist. Mm. But uh, as, as far as being able to see, this uh, material comes, at least the, the, the main influence is directly from, from the elite from Pedmont in the 40s. Mm. And for them is mostly what is coming from the French illustrated weeklies. I was not able to find any clear link between, um, how can I say, popular prints from the, uh, let's say, uh, 18th century mm, and the uh, comics tradition that start to appear in the 40s in the 19th century. Of course, at a certain time, uh, popular prints start again to happen, for example, by uh, Stella Macchi Mercenario in Milan. And there are some of them which are basically retelling very simple fable, like, uh, well, like Bush in the end. Huh? But uh, I'm not so sure if it is, if it comes really from the folklore or if everything is mediated anyhow from, again, Bush and the other. Mm. Do not know. And that one print you showed from the uh, 18th century, the, the guilt, you say it was Gilray inspired. Mm -hmm. Is there a lot of material like that in Italian? There is some material, not so many of them, because uh, you can find instead a few few more things like uh, the one by uh, uh, Swiping Hogarth, Mariage à la Mode. Mm -hmm. There were m more of them. Because again, the theme was much less controversial. Again, you have to think about strong censorship, mm? right. where yeah, everything that's... was kind of, uh, how can I say, borderline. Right. So my impression is that there is a hiatus of 20 years. Basic, I mean, maybe we will discover something completely, <laughs> completely new and uh, game changing, but there is for sure a 20, 30 year of hiatus where very little comics wise is produced until we reach the uh, 47 48 right so yeah and and did you track the 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 relevance or the the rise of the um academy of <laughs> art in in venice i guess particularly on no just how people were making picture you know when text moved out of the picture and when it moved in back into the picture things like that. i agree no 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 no. this so, one could be of course a bias of my of my own research mm? yeah, yeah and, uh, which has been mostly like a like emanuela was saying on, on popular print popular culture then to say prints weekly and so on and so forth and but i mean that's one and other things that could be worthwhile to to check but at least on the popular side i would say no mm -hmm. but again the popular side right well yeah i mean in in the the rest of europe there's a big play between high and popular art you mm -hmm. know these things are all mm -hmm. all connected in some strange way but anyway mm -hmm. thank you great talk thanks Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have time for, uh, I think, a couple more questions. Okay. It's, yeah. Gay, Gay Lodi and then Manuela. Hi. Thank you. Hi. That was a fabulous talk. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, so, Bush was very important in Italy, and Bush inspired the Cats and Jammer Kids, uh, we believe, mm -hmm. directly. Bush was reprinted throughout Europe and in America. It's starting to sound as if Bush is more important than Topfer. I don't know <laughs> that you would react to or anyone else would care to respond to, but he's certainly a, a huge presence in this narrative, is he not? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I would say, uh, well, no, uh, no Topfer expert around. I would say yes, mm -hmm. at least uh, for the 
But again, uh, it's true that uh, Bush was uh, quite more often reprinted in comics children. So maybe it was one of the culprits for uh, making comics for children in Italy. Mm -hmm. But it's true that the influence of Bush was quite important in Italy. It was reprinted often and uh, I mean, it appeared continuously and for um, 20, 25 years everywhere. Uh, 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 it was reprinted by who, whom, whoever had the chance of uh, putting his hands or her hands on the woodcuts <laughs> and it was rechanged re and so on and so forth. And there were, in fact, a few the, the few artists who actually did uh, for Folletto de Bambini Italian materials were quite uh, uh, reminiscent of the material by Bush, actually, and very few by the other artists. For example, there is almost no Mackendorf in, uh, in Italy, hmm? which is one of the other important... Mackendorf, did I pronounce it right? I hope so. Uh, another important German artist who was almost absent from, from uh, the Italian. But again, since we do not know exactly how they arrived, we only know that they, at the time they were, like Bruschi was, uh, Biagi was saying to Bruschi, go to the printer, take that woodcut uh, that I will start penning the verses behind and so on and so forth. But it's impossible to understand how they put their hands on those uh, on those materials, different from, for example, on what happened to to fair where we know exactly how they how it moved from France to England to the to the UK to the to the states. So of course there is a lot more research, but I would say that at least at the end of the nineteenth century, Bush was, I mean, Topfer was basically unknown except maybe as a, as a writer. Hmm? While instead, Bush was very very present. There was even a special Christmas issue by Corriere della Sera, which was completely devoted to Bush, with his name there. So, I mean, <laughs> definitively important. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think, yeah, um, we maybe have time for just one more question from, I think, Manuela. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Fabio. It was uh, an incredible talk. Uh, I have tons of questions, but I will just ask you one about mm -hmm. the yellow kit, uh, mm -hmm. which in Italy, so mm, someone in the chat noticed that um, he's not yellow, his vest is white in the Italian mm -hmm. uh, version. And if I'm not wrong, I could see that the title called him Bebe, so rather yes. like being, rather than yeah, look here. Um, so I was really curious about this because, of course, we know that in the US, modern comics are linked to the publication of the Yellow Kid. And we have it. In Italy, it's irrelevant. In Italy, it's it. Yellow Kid is, so is irrelevant. But is it like, does it keep on getting published in, in Novellino? How often does it appear? Or is it just like a one off Once. and then that's it? That's it. Never again. At no. least, I mean, I checked, uh, I would say, 20 years of Novellino. So I feel rather confident that, that it's the only is the only appearance. While instead we see a lot of Foxy Grandpa and Cats and Jammer kids, like I was saying. Play, quite a lot. I mean, Cats and Jammer, I can still understand Foxy Grandpa. Of course, it's renamed in all the possible ways, retraced. Sometimes it is attributed to Yambo and other artists, but it's clearly Foxy Grandpa. Mm -hmm. And uh, well. <laughs> only once and of course it's called uh, I agree with Mike but that's, <laughs> that's uh, and uh, and what happened is that uh, um, it was called Il Phonographo di Bebe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, of course uh, Phonograph of Bebe which is of baby Bebe is a generic name for a baby in Italy mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was nothing connected at all. I mean, the, 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 the page is well known. I mean, it's the one with the parrot and one of the first balloon in uh, Yellow Kids. Uh, um, but I mean, and of course it was much longer. It was uh, eight vignette. Here they are cut to four with a text which has absolutely nothing to do with the original, uh, with the original one. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Ah, no, no, sorry. Uh, Guy, you're right. Of course, Yellow Kid is relevant at the same time, at the same way that uh, Corriere di Piccoli was relevant, uh, in the sense that they started a, a wave. Okay, is I would just say that for Italy is basically relevant because it makes only one appearance in a completely cut form, and then it never appears again until uh, well until the sixties, so nineteen sixties. So, for of course for the um, uh, maybe like Luke is saying, Foxy and Cat Jammer sixties were easier to adapt to a middle class pseudo Italian context. I do not know. Of course, the text is, com that one could be indeed. Anyhow, keep in mind that the text, which is printed in Ovellino, has nothing to do with the original text. It's completely rewritten. Mm -hmm. So usually the uh, eight vignette strip is cut to four, mm -hmm. and the text is completely changed. And even with some direct discourse in the, in the text, so it could be, in fact, easier to relate in the in the sense that one is about uh, Foxy Grandpa is about a middle class neighborhood, and the other is about uh, some generic rascals, which are always fine. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So sorry, Fabio. Just to um, just the very last thing oh. because you mentioned that in the novellino we have like the same process that happens in uh, Il Corrierino, right? So we have a completely revision of the text that is completely rewritten and changed. Do we have the same rhymed captions, le filastrocche? Yeah, exactly they, they, the they are not, they are, uh, 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 Correrino chose uh, Ottonario, uh, the eight verse, uh, uh, the eight uh, syllabs rhyme. Uh, Novellino is a bit more varied than that. Sometimes there is uh, some prose, sometimes there is some direct discourse. Some other times there are rhymes like it was common for, uh, for, for example, Il Giornale dei Bambini, which was uh, using most often uh, the rhymes, hmm? the verses, I mean, at the, at, at the bottom. So, I mean, it's, Novellino is much more, uh, how can I say, uh, uh, much, much less structured than Corrierino. Hmm? That's to say, Corrierino had the party line and usually always Ottonari, not always, but I would say 90% of the time, even more Ottonari. And while instead the Novellino, anything goes. It's true that Novellino, for example, changed the director and the publisher a few times along his uh, editorial life, while instead Corrierino was always owned by Corriere della Sera with the same director for 25 years. So that one also can, can explain a lot, I think. <laughs> Yeah, so could that be the reason why the Corriere dei Piccoli was um, like changed the Italian comics landscape, like the structure that it was always the same, whereas like mm -hmm. Novellino, it's more dynamic. So maybe could that be one of the reasons why Corriere dei Piccoli was way more popular than Novellino, despite Novellino being, I mean, introducing Oof. a lot of new things? Oh, if, I don't know. I think that uh, the, um, well, think about the print run. For example, the fact that uh, Corriere, Corriere dei Piccoli was heavily advertised in Corriere della Sera, which had an important print run at the time. So, I mean, they, they are both things like you have good authors, but at the same time, you have a much more uh, advertising on important magazine, newspaper, and you have a, a large print run. And both things, I think... Uh, Converged. I'm not so sure how much of Novellino we go we can see in the north, for example. It was well known in Rome. It was reasonably well known in Tuscany. I mean, uh, uh, from the few witnesses that we can find, but I've not so far found any proper witness from the north. Even if, uh, if you want, if you want to have fun, in the first. Uh, in the second year, actually, they like Corrierino de Piccoli, they had. Uh, uh, four additional pages uh, out of the magazine, basically for advertising and for letters to the publisher, where everybody writes uh, all the most incredible things and they, they put all the different names for the kind of stories in picture that they are, um, uh, that they are printing. Uh, and they, with all the readers asking, uh, how can I call this? How can I call this? It's uh, um, I mean, this kind of... Uh, 
of things that, and then maybe you could be worthwhile to do an in-depth analysis of who was the readership of, of Novellino just looking at the at the letter, which is biased, of course, because it's only the letters that were printed, but maybe you can get to ready some, some grasp of what was going on at the at the time. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, I oh, see. Mike. Yeah, yeah Sorry. I see. So we, we, we can, yeah, maybe we can close with this last question and then uh, bring it to an end because I think we are already going overboard with time, which is fine mm -hmm. by me, but you know, maybe someone else has something to do. <laughs> Uh, so uh, so yeah. let's yeah. say if you're if you're talking about uh, 19th century and especially after the 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 reunification everybody was speaking uh, well the formal italian mm? that to say basically tuscan mm? at least uh, at the at the time why because even if italy was not unified until the 60s of the 18th century the Tuscan uh, was already the standard for the elite, so to say, at least since the 16th century and the work of Bembo. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, every uh, if Tuscan was at least a common language for the elite. Of course, popular press was, I mean, uh, the people were, were, talking, were speaking dialect and not Italian, but for as far as I was able to to see everything is uh, in uh, an Italian uh, dialect. If you also check, for example, the, of course, Marfisa, the Ogart like that I've seen, was produced in Florence. Mm? Okay, so for sure was uh, talking uh, Italian. Mm? Uh, but even the one about from Venice or the uh, caricature from uh, uh, Mondo Illustrato, which was from Turin, they were all using the standard Italian, which was, of course, intended for a high class, for a higher class. But again, Mondo Illustrato at the time was so expensive that only higher classes could afford it. <laughs> so everybody was able to understand Italian. Actually, if I can say so, in Turin would have been uh, uh, would have been better to publish it in French because, of course, uh, people was more familiar with French than Italian in Turin in the forties. Okay, but anyhow, let's say it was the standard Italian. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Like, thank I want to thank again everyone who is here for for joining us today, and of course Professor Gaducci for a, a really a fascinating talk. Uh, and yeah, I think this is a, a good time to bring this uh, discussion to an end. But of course, I hope uh, you know you can continue exchanging ideas, and I hope to uh, I mean, see many of you to our upcoming events. We are still working on our calendar, but uh, I think in the uh, in this upcoming year, starting from January, we will have a lot more uh, talks and a lot more uh, events. So if you manage to find us now, like <laughs> keep doing that. Like I don't know how you find us, but uh, for sure you can find you can follow the uh, the Department of Italian Studies on Instagram and Facebook, or uh, keep subscribing to our um, uh, email uh, mailing lists. And that's it. Thank you so much and hope to see you soon. Thanks again. Hey, and if I may say so, thanks again to the organizer, to Andrea and Manuel and so on. And of course, uh, my mail address is easy to, to find on, on the web. Please, uh, if, you are, if you like uh, and like to exchange uh, uh, chat and so on, please write me. I'm always happy to discuss about the topics. Thanks again to everybody for being here. Thank you. Thank you.